Uh, so first of all, welcome everyone to the Consumer Consent Council DEI Committee uh, monthly meeting. Um, I'm very excited today for our conversation. Um, this has been a long time in the making, um, but as you all know, Living Tree is definitely one of the largest brands in our industry. Um, you know, uh, I fortunately have had the uh, the opportunity to work with Lending Tree. I actually almost worked for them years ago, selling a company called Get Smart uh, to Lending Tree. Um, and so obviously I've been around kind of the Lending Tree world, um, you know, as a, not only, you know, a, a, a company that's being, that's been sold to them, but a partner and a close friend to many that are there. So I'm really excited today to have this conversation with uh, Kimberly Moyer and Tonya Smith, uh, both with Lending Tree, to really talk about their journey and what's been happening with DE&I within you know, such a large brand within our space. I know we've had several conversations before with individual companies. We've had conversations with individuals, um, uh, various nonprofit organizations. And this is really an opportunity for us to get to some deeper insights into what one of the leading companies in our industry is actually doing with DE&I. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to both uh, Kimberly and Tanya, and you can take it from here. Thank you so much, Matt. Let me get our presentation pulled up. Um, and Tanya, do you wanna go ahead and start introductions while I'm doing that? Oh, oh sure. Hi everyone, my name is Tanya Rice Smith. I'm a senior project manager, um, and I'm also the co-founder and co-lead for the diversity and inclusion group here at Lending Tree. Um, the work that we're doing in this space has become a passion for me, being on the side of where diversity, equity, and inclusion directly impact, impacts major decisions and experience in my life. It just feels natural to be an advocate for. Thank you, Tanya. Um, and Matt, it's not letting me, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. That would be Rob Siever. Hold on one second. Thank you. All right. Let me pop it in. Press. We'll see if two years into this thing, we can show a presentation <laughs> with efficiency. Are we good? Um, there we go. There's Tanya's amazing headshot. Um, thank y'all for having us. I am Kimberly Moyer. I've been with Lending Tree just over two years. Um, officially started as a human resources business partner, supporting kind of our tech analytics arms of our organization. Um, and when I first joined, I reported to CHRO. I set a version of, hey, I really care about DEI work put me in coach. If there's anything that I can help or play a role on, um, let me know. And my boss, Joel Olmstead said at the time, well, actually we have this grassroots team of employees who have started trying to put some things together. And I would love to kind of complement that with a dedicated person on the HR side of the house, corporate side of the house to kind of marry the initiatives together. And thus um, I'm also voluntold a DEI program manager for the company for the past two years as well. Um, Matt, I'm going to share a little bit about how we come to this work, and I thought a lot about it. If somebody had asked me this maybe two years ago, and they did, and this is how I would have answered, is that I kind of always cared about this work. I was raised in a family where doing the right thing for others and inclusivity was just part of how we operated. Um, but when I really thought about it, especially in the workplace, about six years ago in my previous employer, I was in a position where a lot of employees for whatever reason just started coming to me and sharing with me their experiences um, in the office every day. And I realized how much I did not know was happening and, and just how varied experiences were for employees across the gamut. And that is really what catapulted my dedicated focus and energy um, into the DEI space. Um, so what I'd love to do today is just tell you all a little bit about our journey. Tanya and I are kind of going to ping pong back and forth between our corporate big picture lens and then our grassroots employee, um, employee group 
perspective and we're going to keep it real. I asked Matt if that was okay. And I said, look, like we, I'm really proud of what we've accomplished in the past two and a half years. And it may surprise some of you all how far we have to go in our journey, given how long Lending Tree's been around and how big of a company we are. Um, but we really believe in being authentic and transparent about um, what we're learning. And that's how we operate with our employees. So with that, let me get started with maybe sharing a little bit just of our current makeup, this is a little bit old data. This is from late 2021, but just for you all to get some perspective about who is Lending Tree from an employee population perspective. Um, the first with our levels is really our mix between um, gender and something that I would call out here is our total female population is about 43%. But as you see in these leadership positions, um, we start making pretty good traction up to the senior manager level. It's almost 50-50 women and men in leadership. And then we have a significant drop off from the senior manager to director level. And then it kind of stays flat from there. So that is, we'll come back to this later, some of the data and insights that we've been drawing, but that is one thing that we've, we've realized and we're working on. Um, from a race perspective, we our race mix overall has stayed about the same over the past two or three years. We've had some departments um, increase in diversity and others lose, and on the whole, it stayed pretty much flat. Um, our tenure, you'll see it's about half and half of, I would say, new employees under maybe the two-year mark and then employees who have been here very long time. So it's a good um, mix of perspectives. We have a lot of like, well, old lending tree, we would have felt this way. And then lots of new employees who have new and emerging ideas about the way things should be. And that'll come to play in a little bit. And I'll share some of our, our journey there. Um, and then when it comes to age, um, we're overall a young company, but we do have a good mix um, from a, an age perspective in the company. One other thing I wanted to show you all for the first time in 2021, we do an annual um, engagement day. And for the first time, we introduced some voluntary additional demographic questions to better understand our employee population. Um, these categories are ones that our vendor culture AMP recommended to us, and we had never had any insight as to like the number of size of these populations in our company at all. So um, this was a really good first pass for us to kind of understand who are our employees. It was um, voluntary anonymous, and so um, this is really kind of the bulk of the insight we had from it from there, but it was good information for us to begin to be more inclusive and in even understanding our population. So let's drop it back, way back to the beginning of how this all began. Tanya, do you want to talk about um, the DIG group and how it all started? Sure. Um, so this, as far as the DIG group is concerned, this stands for Diversity and Inclusion Group. And this is our mission and purpose. So back in 2019, several things happened that led to the creation of DIG. Um, there was, in the beginning of uh, 2019, there was no mention of MLK Day. So an employee contacted HR to discuss opportunities to highlight that in the future. Also during that year, there was a group of us that had been getting together since 2017, where we discussed things um, about work, life, and shared experiences. And we had a conversation about gender bias, um, racism, and microaggression uh, at work. Later that week, I had seen a post by another, um, a new um, employee who was asking if there was some sort of diversity council or group um, uh, in Lending Tree. And this was on Lending Tree's idea incubator. So I invited um, him to our group. And that's when basically we had our first meeting to discuss the creation. And then in December, 2019, we met with HR and our new chief human resource officer, Jill, and she gave us the thumbs up to start the group. And as a matter of fact, she was excited. Um, she wanted to do something, um, but did not have resources. So we basically organically formed and became the resources. So one of the uh, first things that we did was um, we organized the first um, MLK day of service um, in January of 2020. Um, we also met with other companies like um, uh, Citigroup and GM uh, to get guidance on how to start and run a group like this. And one of the best advice we got was from um, Citigroup, and they said, don't try to boil the ocean. So that helped calm us down and uh, um, set our focus. Um, just as we felt 
that we were formally ready to announce our presence to the company, COVID hit. World shuts down, we go remote. And although we continued to work behind the scenes, a lot of our plans were, um, were halted because we were, we were remote. And um, then in 2020, May of 2020, George Floyd was killed. And it's a whirlwind from there. Our group is announced um, by the CEO and everything just um, basically takes off. Uh, we already had a Slack channel with about, I think it was about 30 or 40 members. Uh, we made it public and all of a sudden a third of the company is in the Slack channel with us. So it, 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 it happened organically and, um, and it happened basically just like that. That was our history. I thought I had our timeline slide next, but it's one more, so I apologize. I was trying to pull it up to some of you. <laughs> so then when we all came together, like Tanya said, we um, were kind of a hodgepodge group of people who all earnestly wanted to support DEI at Lending Tree, but we didn't necessarily um, have an aggregated singular North Star or like mission of these are the things that we're going to do. So we spent some time coming together um, to really think about like, what do we care about and what kinds of experiences are we trying to drive in the company? Um, a lot of this came from our CHRO kind of riffing of like, this is what, if I were to think about what I want for employees, um, this is where I would start. And so what you'll see throughout this today, and we'll talk about at the end, is we really are starting with an employee-centric focus. Um, we felt like before we can, um, maximize you know our impact to consumers or what have you as inclusive as possible we need to start at home we need to look internally at what we're doing and how our employees are feeling um, and so that is kind of the theme that will carry through and the three pillars that it's kind of comes down to it's not rock science and maybe they're not the right ones but they're they're what we've got for now our representation so what literally is our mix of employees especially when you start getting at the manager and above and above levels in the company um, opportunity. So who is getting promoted? Who is getting picked for development cohorts? Who's getting picked for mentorship opportunities? Who is getting access and resources to be successful? And then the last one, the big one is belonging. And so can employees be their true selves um, and feel like they can show up to work every day without having to minimize parts of who? And then those layer on really um, complementary with the DIG group itself and some of the goals that they had established. Do you want to talk about those some more, Tanya? Sure. Um, on the DIG side, uh, our goals are basically to create initiatives that support diversity, equity, and inclusion, focusing on our key areas, which was hiring, promotions, and retention. That goes back to what Citigroup had said, is don't try to boil the ocean. So we're like, okay, hiring, promotion, retention. Um, we aim to be a resource that speaks uh, up for our employees in an effort to retain our talent resources um, and a light on unfairness when people are being passed up on promotions um, because the measurements can be subjective and also to advocate and help broaden the hiring funnel so that our workforce can become more diverse. Yep, exactly. So to walk through a little bit of our timeline. So this is a lot to take in. The this is two years worth of work condensed in about eight bullet points. So this is not um, the end all be all, but I wanted to kind of highlight some of the things. And we'll start with um, 2020, which um, Tanya already started talking about. We were having um, positive forward momentum in conversations. The um, murder of George Floyd prompted round, employee roundtables where we had groups come together. They were facilitated by either a member of the DIG leadership team or HR to give employees a space to talk and process, you know, how they were feeling. Um, Juneteenth was given off as a company holiday for the first time. Um, we had the momentum and one of our uh, DIG team members created an Ally 101 training for um, employees who were not part of the LGBTQ community, but wanted to be supportive. And a lot of like, I don't even know what the terms are. How can I help? I don't want to say the wrong thing. It was kind of that. And that was completely employee led. Um, and we were doing great. And we felt like we were on track and we were making really good progress. And we had um, an event that we don't really we don't really necessarily have one singular name, but we all kind of represent it and understand it as a pivotal moment in our DEI journey. Um, it was something that took place in Slack. 
So on September 30th, um, our diversity and inclusion Slack channel up until this point had really been a place where people would post different links and articles, primarily about things going on in our local community, but not exclusively. Did you see this happen? Did you see this buildings being, or this neighborhoods being torn down and, you know, whatever a new high rise is going to go up in its place, things like that. And for whatever reason, um, an employee rejoined the Slack channel and had a lot of up frustration and feelings about what his perspective of what the Slack channel was supposed to be and what diversity and inclusion and lending treatment. And he had been here for a few hours, I mean, a few years, um, and had a perspective that we used to be inclusive, but now all white people are racist. And if we don't prescribe to one singular point of view, then we're not invited to be a part of this conversation is the spirit of his um, perspective. And what started as an earnest attempt to engage in a productive conversation, over 15 employees were kind of back and forth. Well, let me hear your point. Why are you thinking about that? I don't think about it this way. Have you considered this? Uh, you know, quite frankly, it devolved into a very unproductive and personal conversation where people's personal social media campaign, you know, um, accounts were pulled in and, you know, well, if you're so great, why did you do this? And it was just that kind of a thing. And so um, we all huddled together virtually. I'd been back from maternity leave only for a few weeks and was like, oh my goodness, what do we do? And so the DIG leadership team and I jumped on a call and we were trying to figure out where is the line in protecting our employees and um, allowing freedom of speech. And how do we think about our communication standards in the company and what we want to allow to exist in this space? Um, Tanya, do you wanna talk about what was going through y'all's heads or some considerations in that conversation? Yes. Um, that day, Wanchi Gar Slack channel basically blow up. Um, it's like time pause. I remember first seeing the post, um, it basically was asking what was the purpose of the channel. Uh, we're feeding into um, ide the ideology of racism um, for perpetrating white people are racist and black people are victims. And also uh, the questioning as far as um, white privilege. And this was all before 9 a.m. And um, I, along with, with the leadership and the colleagues were stunned people were triggered. I literally remember telling the dig leaders that I had to step back and digest. By 10.30, um, he had spoken more and I understood this was a white man who had suffered unspeakable trauma and came up in poverty. He questioned where was his white privilege? And I was understanding where he was coming from because a lot of the terms that were being thrown out into the channel, articles that were being shared about white privilege, defund the police, were not also adequately being explained. And with that brought a lot of understanding, which led to the, basically the grenade being thrown off in the channel. Um, there was a lot of side um, chats going on, disbelief, shock, people met at angry, mad. A lot of people of color felt their feelings and experiences were now invalidated. Um, so once, um, as Kimmy said, around 12 o'clock is when the, the, the channel was paused because it was getting um, way too personal. But I remember just being, so in awe of all the people who had spoke up, all of the allies um, who had spoke up to try to um, talk and reason and explain and, and just try to um, uh, make the situation better. And um, yeah, that, that definitely was a, a pivotal day. So here is the, um... The next day, which we didn't plan it this way when Tanya was going to be my partner for this today, but then realized that she was the one who actually wrote the next day. And, and I don't expect you all to read all of this, but we basically just had the Slack channel paused for half a day. The next morning we reopened it. It was really important to us that we re-engage and reopen the lines of dialogue, but we realized that like we needed to set formal parameters about like what we expect this space to be. Um, and then over the next couple of months, we put a little bit more additional formality around that. But I would tell y'all, um, it's never been the same. And it's something that we are still trying to grapple with. What is the right tension between supporting freedom of expression and having a, a safe place for employees? And I personally remember feeling very torn on what do we do here? And ultimately, I just felt like 
protecting our employees' mental health and well-being. And it's like the Hippocratic Oath, like at the very first, do no harm kind of a thing. Um, and we felt like we just had to dis and, you know, turn it off and and end that kind of narrative or back and forth personal attacks. Um, all right, so hard pivot. So then going back into 2021, um, you know, in 2020, we had had like lots of little sprinkling of good efforts and good energy. And we thought, let's put something a little bit more programmatic and structural in place for DEI this year. So like, let's really start to move the needle on some of our programs and why do um, white people get disproportionately promoted and things like that. Um, but in order to do that, we wanted to understand what is the state of our of our company. What at the time we didn't know that white people were disproportionately promoted and things like that. And so we basically took the stance of like let's inventory our processes and programs and procedures and uh, what are our hiring rates and attrition rates and promotion rates and what are our um, feedback scores from the engagement survey along different demographic lines. And it was all very well um, intended, very good, meaningful work. But y'all, it took months. It's the middle of COVID. This is nobody's official full-time job. This is everybody is doing this work in addition to what they're currently doing. Um, it was the first time we'd ever done anything like this. And we had committed to sharing the insights with the organization. And so like, we wanted to get it right. We wanted to do, have accurate we had to clean up our data. It was a labor of love. Um, and so I'll show you what we learned from it and or the outcome of this data analysis. And then I want to jump back and show you what we learned from kind of our 2020. Um, so overall, our data insights, and then we did focus group conversations um, with employees to kind of get the qualitative feedback to match up the quantity we had gotten. And they you know, for better words, were at least very much aligned. And the three main themes that came out were um, the lack of representation at senior level at senior levels made it difficult for employees to feel like they could see themselves succeeding. Um, they didn't have mentors that they could turn to, or they didn't feel like they had somebody that would advocate for them behind. Um, and this is across multiple identity groups. So we did these focus groups with um, nine identity groups that had significant lower engagement scores. So um, black employees, Latino women, um, employees with disabilities, caregivers to adults, some of the LGBTQ um, were having completely different experiences than maybe. Um, the second theme was that in, inconsistent employee experiences were very much a thing. So some employees, um, you know, even people of color were like, I feel like I am supported. I've gotten promoted three times and I feel like I, you know, my manager has my back and I'm doing great, but that was not the norm. And so what we found is just that um, it was just not an equal, playing field and there was something else at play for how people were getting promoted and opportunities and who was being selected to get development and things like that. Um, and then the last is that our DEI efforts could seem performative. So if you all think we spent, we had a couple of um, initiatives going on behind the scenes, but let me jump back over here. I don't know if anything stands out to any of you all about what initiatives we did in 2021, but they are all so programmatic that like employees don't feel them, right? Like you don't see them. This isn't a, a, an event or something that an employee has been learning or benefiting from in real time. And I'm glad that we did the data analysis. It is tremendously impactful in the um, goals that we have for 2022 and our roadmap for DEI, you know, for the next three to five years. And that being said, we really lost touch with our employee population and who we were trying to serve to begin with. Um, and that is probably my biggest takeaway for you all today or biggest lesson learned from us is great, go do this work. Um, but we, I think because we were not communicating along the way, the insights, we waited and did the big reveal and it didn't take place until October again, cause it's COVID and we were way overwhelmed. Um, 
that employees just weren't brought in along the way. And so that was probably one of the biggest lessons that I, I've learned. And we are working to kind of come up with some ways that we can rebuild, rebuild trust in those lines of communication with the employee population at large. Tanya, what would you say? You were front lines hearing some of that feedback. Yeah, there was a lot of feedback like, what's happening? What are we doing? Did it just die off? Because um, a lot of things we were, uh, a lot of things were happening behind the scenes. But um, as far as, you know, we have monthly meetings and we're telling the team, you know, things are being worked on, being worked on, but they're not seeing any fruit of the, of the labor uh, right away. But on the flip side, when they did present the data and shared it with us, and the focus groups, those I would say were definitely two pivotal events um, for, um, for 2021. Everyone was impressed that Lending Tree really gathered the data, but also that they really shared it with us, especially because it basically showed us what we all knew anyways, that um, we needed help with diversity um, and the makeup of the, um, of the makeup of our workforce and that the promotion uh, practices was very subjective. So for them, for, for Lending Tree to present this data to us and it not be fudged in any type of way um, was, was definitely um, appreciated by, by the employees. And then with the focus groups, um, employees were itching to talk. They wanted to say something. They didn't necessarily have the faith that things would be done, but they did want their voices to be heard. So um, there was an appreciation for those two tasks. Kimberly and Tonya, um, uh, Melissa Murphy has a quick question sure. that I think is relevant to the conversation. Melissa? Melissa, are you there? Melanie Murphy. Yeah. Oh, Melanie, yeah, can, excuse me. I'm can sorry. you guys? It's okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. All right. Excellent. Yeah, I was just kind of curious about how you, um, how you did the focus groups. Did you, um, you know, facilitate them internally, or did you leverage an external partner to to help with it? I'm glad you asked. I actually meant to mention this. We um, were working with a third party consultant on a couple of bodies of work. They quote us, quoted us fifteen thousand dollars to do this, and we had zero dollars in our budget. Mm -hmm. Um, so we were like, okay, we're going to do it the lending tree way. We're going to do it ourselves, um, which pros and cons to that approach. Um, we had one session facilitated, or I guess two sessions facilitated by that external third party as part of kind of the existing agreement we already had with them. And I do think that that session, based off the feedback that we heard from employees, was the most vulnerable, the most honest, the most transparent. Um, the other seven sessions were facilitated by different leaders in the HR departments, um, and we just kind of divided and conquered. Um, and it was productive, but I do wonder if it would have been more, um, more honest or if we would have gotten a little bit different results if it had been a third party. Makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So going into 2022, um, we kind of pull through those data insights, the focus group feedback, the DIG leadership team, and then the HR leadership team kind of all came together um, to boil down what do we want to work on um, in 2022. And hopefully this year, it is a good mix of employee facing and programmatic kind of policy changes. So this is a lot to take in. Um, I'm not going to go too deep. Under each of these categories, we probably have eight different tactical initiatives that fly into it. So if anybody wants to follow up offline or has any questions about some of the specifics, I'm happy to go deep with anybody, but just for the sake of time, um, wanted to kind of keep it at a high level. Um, increasing hires of women and people of color, really tying into our representation. Our data, HR data expert um, calls it our body in motion versus our body at rest. And basically what we found is like our body in rest, if we are not actively seeking to attract um, women and people of color and people with disabilities and people who are, you know, in the LGBTQ community, they're not actively applying. There is a certain demographic who actively applies to Lending Tree and it is not any of those. And so for us to increase our representation, we have to be intentional and we have to change something about our strategy around hiring. Um, Tanya, anything you wanna jump in on that one? Um, 
this one, I mean, definitely is important to me. I've been in the tech field for 26 years and a, a lot of, most of that time, I'm one of the few women, if not the only, and the only black person in the room. I've watched the hiring practices and it's natural for people to want to hire somebody that looks like you or thinks like you or that you're comfortable with. So taking as much bias out of the hiring process and opening that pipeline for a much diverse talent will be, will be wonderful. And so we are trying to partner with um, a couple of organizations to really focus on early talent and technology and how do we, um, you know, find people from differing backgrounds, especially to come into our entry level roles. Maybe they've come out of boot camps and things like that as one of the initiatives. We're partnering with an organization called Year Up, for example. I don't know if y'all heard of them from other companies. Um, the second one is around compensation. So one key practice that we kind of evolved is we used to, we would go through our annual compensation process and at the end of it, we would audit for um, how merit adjustments were kind of doled out and how bonuses were paid out on race and gender and we would look and then the data was um you know on its face equitable but it was kind of like we did that at the end so like by luck did that shake out that way and not by intent and so what we added this year is while we were within the process we were auditing and catching things and and filtering things by race and gender to say like well why is this shaking up this way and i'll tell y'all i had a um and some of this just comes down to like manager misunderstanding or perception and, and no negative intent. I had a manager who said to, or I audited his team and all of the men on his team were at a hundred percent of their merit and all of the women at his team were below a hundred percent of merit. And there were a couple of men who were over a hundred percent. And I said, well, I thought this, these women did really well this year. Like I thought they had a good year. Why are we giving them less less salary and he said well I had to take it from somewhere and insert bias he just have to he didn't know he did it that way he didn't mean to do it that way he just literally happened to take it from all of the women and so that's where we had a chance to say like no we can pay the women a hundred percent of their merit adjustment if they earned it and let's figure out if somebody's a really high performer how can we like make them whole or come up with that at the top of the house with their funding so there are just some things like that that we did in real time to make sure that we had equitable outcomes at the end we are also going to be using a third party which i just heard this morning we have officially sent off um, to do a salary bonus and equity um, pay parity analysis for us um, on the lines of race and gender. So that's something that we will have in July. And we are committed to communicating back to the organization the insights from that. And we'll have to, you know, on its face, we think we're doing a pretty good job, but we haven't put the analytical rigor behind it to officially know yet. Um, increasing formal development and upward mobility. So um, one thing that we found when we did some of our data analysis is, who is identified as top talent and having potential then informs who gets the development opportunities and the mentorship opportunities, and then that informs who gets promoted. And so what we found is that white people and men were disproportionately rated as high potential and high performers relative to the population size. And therefore, we're disproportionately getting development opportunities and disproportionately getting promoted. And so what we're doing now is, um, trying to, sorry, I was getting a call, um, take out, enhance our definitions and how we assess talent to begin with, and then add in more formal um, development opportunities for targeted populations where you don't have to meet some other criteria in order to get a mentor kind of a thing. What would you add to that, Tanya? I know this is something you're passionate about. Um, yes, as um, I'm, I'm a project manager, so I work with developers all the time. I'm on the tech side at LendingTree, and all of my software developers are mostly always men. Um, when I do get a few women come in, a lot of times um, and within a year or so, they leave. So having that formal development and support in, in, in their careers, I, I think would be great. So I am, I am very passionate about the formal development aspect of, of these goals. Yeah. 
Um, the next one is a big one. So leadership awareness and involvement in DEI initiatives. Um, our CEO cares about DEI. He, we actually need, have, haven't had one in 2022 yet. We need to get one back on the calendar, but he had been having a regular cadence with the DIG leadership team meeting to talk about how things were going. Um, but they're like caring about it and then being involved, having accountability measures. There's a big big um, delta and, and journey there. And so we are for the first time this year introducing a balanced scorecard for our executives where one of the criteria that they are going to be measured on in addition to financial performance and things like that is going to be um, some leadership and DEI um, indexes and criteria. So that's a big one. Um, and then something that we're hoping to roll out by the end of the year is a DEI council, where similar to the DIG um, leadership team, there are employees from diverse backgrounds, ages, levels within the company. And then we also want those to be embedded within each business unit so that that specific leader has a partner and people in his, his or her own organization that they can partner with on DEI things that are relevant to that team. What would you add, Tanya? Um, I know this is maybe the biggest one front of mind for the DIG leadership team, something that we want to see this year. Yeah, I, I will be totally honest. The silence of some of the leaders um, during 2020 and 2021 was deafening, and that was echoed throughout um, the, the DIG group. We've had several companies, uh, we, when we talk to several companies, we know that we cannot become more inclusive and equitable uh, more inclusive or equitable workplace if we don't have leadership buy-in. So one of the things I, we, we would love is that they become more educated in how ultimately diversity uh, of thought, of process, of ideas is good for business and is good for the bottom line. So that's yeah. my, yeah. It's a good push. Um, and then the last one, Inclusion, we really see as an output of the um, all of the efforts before. So if employees are getting equal opportunities to get developed and promoted and be invested in and make money, um, they're going to be happy and they're going to want to stay at the company. And that is really an output of all of the other things. But with that being said, we also are working on some employee events, enhancing our benefits offerings to be more inclusive, especially um, we got a lot of feedback from our employees who are caregivers to adults, often their parents, but not always, that they have no idea how to navigate. They need benefits. They need help. How do I go into this space? So that's something we're going to add this year. Um, and we have a large uh, philanthropic arm of our, I guess it's separate from our organization, but that we partner with um, that brings in some DEI philanthropic content that we're able to get employees involved in. And I'll show you all a picture of that at the end. Um, that's the high level. Again, there are eight to 10 things under each of these categories. I'd be happy to follow up with anyone if you want to go deep on any um, specific questions there. So to go to kind of our grand vision, this is a very simple um, image of where we're trying to go. But when we sat around and we had conversations to say, like, what would it look like? What would it feel? How would we know? Like, what it, how would we know we made it, that we got there? Um, and it really comes down to this concept of being inclusive by default and extending the DEI capabilities of our company beyond our employee experience and philanthropy from a social impact perspective and really have it embedded into our business practices. So we haven't yet really turned the page on supplier diversity. We are early in our journey on um, accessibility, web accessibility, the products that we build. We have a lot of room to go. Um, I will tell you that the consumer advocacy and how we're thinking about consumers is um, really being renovated. And I don't know if any of y'all have listened to our earnings calls in the past couple of quarters, but there's a lot of um, change taking place there for the good to have the consumer front and center. And so how can we layer on um, an inclusion equitable lens into that consumer advocacy and journey with our, you know, marketing campaigns, customer segmentation, things like that. Um, so that's a little bit to say a lot, but um, Tanya, what else do you want to see coming, coming out of this group in the future? 
so with with this with this um, slide, it's like it means so much because this is this is not easy work, um, but it's some of the most rewarding work um, that I've been part of. And one day, I would love to see Lending Tree be a place where everyone feels like. Um, they belong and are valued for their hard work and talent. I'd love to see it morph into, um, into inclusive business practices that extend to more diverse offerings and experiences to the customer, a customer and making sure that these offer, offerings are equitable and empower all of the consumers across the spectrum. And uh, just important that we're a company um, and employee base that uh, continue to be an agent of change uh, for our community. And um, I, I and I would love to know that um, Dick was a catalyst of change for the good for our colleagues, for our company, for the consumer, and for the community. Very well said. Well, in closing, I would just say um, my advice to I don't know where all of you all are on your journey on this, but just start somewhere. Um, I'm I mean we've really formally only been doing this for two, two and a half years. And so when I look back at what we've accomplished in that amount of time, again, this is Nolan's full-time job. It's incredible. And it, um, it it does make me proud of what we've accomplished. And it's a long journey. We have a lot ahead of us. Um, be honest and put in the work and you're going to make progress. And the other kind of big aha, which seems obvious, but is just keep your employee population, the people that you're serving front and center in the work. And what are the touch points that they see and feel and experience as it relates to this has been a real milestone for us. And then I will just end on this picture just because it's cute of us. A couple months ago, we um, see if you can see spy Tanya and I there, but we volunteered at an organization here in Charlotte called Hope Vibes. They have um, a truck that drives around and has um, washing machine and dryers and shower facilities to help people who are experiencing homelessness. And we volunteered when, um, on our Martin Luther King Day of Service this year, which actually got snowed out. We had to do it on President's Day. Um, but we spent some time together as a group organizing um, some of their hygiene supplies. And this is uh, the majority of our DIG leadership team um, and then a couple of other employees that pitched in as well. So. Well, Kimberly um, and Tanya, I want to thank you so much. <clears throat> This was obviously extremely enlightening, um, I know for me, and uh, I hope you know the other uh, you know members of the committee found found the same. Um, I do have a couple of questions, and obviously would love to open it up to others that are attending. So if you would like to ask a question, please just go ahead and and raise your hand here. Um, first of all, I just want to acknowledge the pillars. I think you know to me that was extremely important because I think that. When we've talked to other organizations, what typically happens is that, you know, they jump right into work around DEI um, without really scoping out exactly what it is that they are trying to accomplish and really working against those pillars. So when I hear representation, opportunity, and belonging, um, it really seems as though when you're taking on items regarding DEI, you're also looking at them in terms of how they fit within that pillar. Is that accurate? Yeah, absolutely. And um, what are the programs, projects, experiences that kind of influence in that pillar? Great, great. The other observation that I made was, I, and, I, and I kind of pointed back to what brought this together as an organization within our industry, um, but that pivotal event, right? I know that this organization came together on the heels of George Floyd. We looked at each other and said, we can do better. Um, we need to make this a much more diverse community. We have indeed done so. And I just could see that even in the last Leeds Con conference. Um, I also saw that within Lead Generation World, just a much more diverse and inclusive environment. Um, but in your case, it was different in that it was an employee stepping up and probably giving the, what I would say is the opposite perspective than what I would have expected to really be able to kind of spark the flame in an organization. What was the impact? And, and Tanya, this is kind of directed at you. I mean, what was your immediate reaction here? I mean, how did you feel as an employee of LendingTree being, you know, obviously a black woman dealing with white privilege. Oh, I was triggered. 
right away I was triggered. I seen that and it was basically an invalidation of my experience. But the more he spoke, the more I understood. I was like, oh, white privilege. No one's really explaining that. He, he didn't have, he doesn't see himself as having privilege. What he wasn't understanding was all the horrible things he went through wasn't because of his skin color, where a lot of things that Black people go through are because of the skin color. So ultimately, those four hours were horrible, but it developed a better understanding of how to communicate and also realizing that in this channel, maybe there needs to be some guidelines set because we just went in and here's the channel and it's open, but we didn't really set this guidelines. It's like, we have to be respectful and maybe a lot of things um, cannot be translated through text. We can't, we don't know the intent behind it. We don't know um, that we don't see the facial expressions. So maybe going forward when we're talking, let's make this a Zoom call, focus group, that type of thing, rather than just um, um, put, posting articles and having conversations about it through Slack. Let's become, let's be more personal about it and, um, and talk about it and, and communicate and make sure that there's, a, if there's a possibility to come out with understanding on both sides, let's come out with understanding on both sides. Doesn't have to be agreement, but just understanding. So I'll tell you, it seems as though, think if you didn't have the Slack channel, Think if you did not have a forum for people to be able to say anything. Mm -hmm. Imagine how that could have festered up in the organization over an extended period of time right. where this could have been a lot worse than it really was. So I commend you all for that as well. I think it was, I mean, I think a lot of times blessings come wrapped in garbage and yeah. <laughs> you have to unwrap it to, to get to it. And I think this was a blessing in disguise. That's, that's a great way to put it without a doubt. Anyone else have any questions or comments they would love, like to share? I, I have to just commend both of you at the way that you approached the entire process because you took the time to evaluate and understand your employees very specifically. And I think that like, unfortunately, a lot of companies are running into a challenge right now where they have very good intentions for increasing their commitment and their practice of DEI, but one size fits all absolutely does not work. And there are some very nuanced needs. And if you don't address them, like Matt described it so well, like if you, if you don't actually address what, what is really affecting your employees and your company, you're not actually solving any of the problems. So I think the fact that you guys took all that time, recognizing that it was going to take time and sometimes that's difficult particularly like for a company like you all right like that you're used to moving fast you do big things saying that we have to wait can be difficult but I want to applaud both of you on that um, I'm I'm interested after learning about the disparity in uh, the merit increases that were kind of naturally pulled from from women often inadvertently because the folks who are making those decisions just assume that there's a husband somewhere in the situation who's earning more money and it's totally fine. I mean, that would be nice. Um, what else are you all considering that is relevant to your employees who identify as women? Um, maybe on that front, specifically a couple things that we're thinking. One is doubling down on education. So in that specific case, the manager thought he was doing what he needed to do. Mm -hmm. So I think like better explaining and having um, companies have all different like amounts of rigor around merit processes and things like that. So if we make it more that like, if you get this rating, you get this percent increase and just take the opportunity for bias and things like that out of the equation. I think that that can be productive. Um, one of the other big ones that our um, head of HR cares about a lot is mentorship and women's access. So, um, and I'll tell you, the, when our executive leadership team saw that graphic and saw, we had a blown up version of it and saw the women, the pipeline of women in leadership and saw it drop by half from the senior manager to director level, it was such a large amount that like everybody immediately understood something is happening here. Like this isn't just something that like this amount of women are just self-selecting out at this level. Um, 
So we are currently starting a mentorship program. Every woman in the entire company is invited to participate if they're interested um, to be a mentor or to gain mentorship in one of, I think, five different tracks. And so that's something that we're piloting for the first year to try to really um, increase access to mentors and capital and other people. I love it. Well, I've already I've already wrote to both you and Tanya, and no one on this call is going to be surprised if most of them have ever seen me for more than three minutes. Um, uh, women of MarTech would like to feature both of you individually in a success spotlight. Um, and I think collectively, there could definitely be a podcast opportunity there. And I, and I think that this is important because you're right, companies like LendingTree do attract a certain profile of job seeker and I speak mortgage and it's my love language. And anytime I have an opportunity to broaden the, the scope for, for women who, or especially younger women who might not think that there's a place for them, um, I jump on that opportunity. So please, please, please make sure that you send me your email address so that we can get that going. But I, I really can't applaud you both enough for just doing amazing things that you're not totally getting paid for as 100% of your job, which is usually pretty difficult. So congratulations for that. Well, thank you for saying thank that. You. And Tanya and the Dig Leadership team, like we have a very good um open and honest partnership, which I think is another ingredient to making this so successful. That's not to say that there aren't points that we disagree on or things that we've, you know, had to have conversations, but having um, to be able to say, I don't see it that way. And this is why, or, well, if you do that, this will happen and have that safe space to partner together has been really instrumental in this. Oh, being yeah. successful. Are there any other questions before we, uh, or comments before we close this out? Sean Reed McGee, you took yourself off mute. And I know you're a man of many words. You know what, first and foremost, yes, I am thoroughly impressed. I, again, thank you so much um, ladies for the presentation. I do have a question. Let me see if I can wrap it up really, really quickly. I wanna talk about something that's probably on the flip side, a little bit more um, challenging, which is the backlash. Right now that you guys have made so many different um, pieces of progress within the industry, within the company over the last two years, guess what? People are used to the privilege that they're used to. People are used to doing maybe half the work and receiving twice the bonus. People are used to this and used to that. And now you guys have actually come and made people, made these hiring um, supervisors aware of what they perhaps were doing subconsciously and now will no longer for most likely do so. The individuals who are used to receiving the response and the benefit thereof will kind of uh, push back. What are you guys prepared to do for 2022 and 2023 as you sit back and try to do your best to alert those hiring managers and supervisors of guess what? You can, you, it's no longer good <laughs> for you to do the practice that you were doing. And so you have to set up a different environment. What are, you, what are your plans for that? Yeah, I'll maybe start and Tanya, you jump in. I would say, first of all, like we're okay with that to a degree. Um, we are trying to meet people where they are and understand like, okay, you're not okay with this. Let's talk about it. What about this is difficult for you? How does this impact you? Where does this resonate with you? One of the things we implemented this past year is for promotions, we have a new criteria for assessing talent and we made everybody get 360 feedback and assess all of their employees against those criteria. And we did have um, some population say like, well, I don't really have to do that though, right? And we held everybody to it. And so it was kind of like the reinforcing of that. But I mean, I will tell you, we are on a journey. We discussed, is this the year, do we put hiring quotas in? So do we say you have to hire a certain number of women and people of color at certain levels in the company? And we didn't go all the way there this year. Um, part of that is because our this market and the recruiting team that we have is extremely understaffed and we were worried about our ability to execute successfully. And the other part is like, where are we in our journey? I could see that coming on the table for us in the future, but it, it, that was a decision that we consciously made not to do this year. What would you add, Tanya? Um, I have already heard that Lending Tree was better before this group started. Um, why do we need the group? 
Yeah, uh, we've heard that. Um, it's we know we're, we're not looked at as favorably across the masses, and that's fine. But we've come in to be an advocate for the employees. So when we hear of someone who feels like um, they're not being treated fairly or they're quitting because of certain issues that they face that were unfair based off of their gender or race, then we want to talk to them. And if they don't feel comfortable, we'll advocate for them. So we're just going to continue pushing on. I applaud both of you guys and your efforts by far. This is a journey and uh, you guys have started and made some incredible progress. So thank you so much for presenting today. Thank you. Thank you. And so on that note, um, I wanna close just with a summary of what I've heard. And obviously you all can um, you know, refute any of this if you'd like, but I, I think that these are some important keys. Number one, start a conversation, right? You need to provide a forum for employees to be able to talk about what's going on with DEI. Second, analyze your business, right? The data and the insights that you can, you can get from the analysis is extremely important in order to make the right decisions about what you're prioritizing. Third, bring employees along in this journey. They need to be involved. It needs to be an active conversation that is not top down or bottoms up. It needs to be a collaboration of the entire organization. And the last point is hold leadership accountable for DEI. That is probably the one message that I've heard through this that we oftentimes don't get to because we just expect this to happen organically in companies. But that accountability is extremely important to be able to ensure that all of the efforts that are going into this work are actually fulfilled. Am I accurate? You nailed it. Can I get that like on a business card that we <laughs> reuse? That was perfect. <laughs> well, well, thank you again. This presentation was incredible. And um, I think it helps companies of all sizes. Um, and you two are, are phenomenal people. So thank you very much for all that you continue to do. And um, thank you all for attending today's meeting, everyone. We'll chat with you all next month. Have a great month, everyone. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.